right, folks, I see that we've opened up the webinar. Folks are um, slowly trickling in. So I'll just start speaking now that we're reaching 12 by welcoming you all on behalf of Forspace to applications and issues in life cycle assessment examining the impact, whereby you'll hear from three Concordia graduate students investigating issues and applications related to life cycle assessment. And after these um, short presentations, we'll have an opportunity for a discussion and a question period moderated by Dr. Shannon Lloyd. This event is part of a week-long series of events on sustainability and the climate crisis brought to you by the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability and the Loyola Sustainability Research Center in collaboration with Forspace. For those of you unfamiliar with us, Concordia University's Forspace, located in downtown Jojage, Montreal, on unceded indigenous land, is a university-wide platform focused on working collab collaboratively excuse me, with our community across disciplines to activate research, teaching, and initiatives via process based explorations. We are currently recording the session and we're live streaming at CU for Space on Facebook. So I'll pop those links into the chat in a second. Uh, you're more than welcome to join in the conversation today. As I mentioned, there will be a Q&A and moments for points of clarification questions after e each presentation. So we invite you to participate in one of two ways. Please use the Q&A box to, if you're a texter and you would like to type out your question, pop it in there and uh, our moderator today will be able to address your questions easily, or you can raise your virtual hand and we will come in and unmute you so that you can speak your question out loud. Of course, the chat is activated for any kind of comments and reflections, but as I say, if you have specific questions, please use the Q&A or the raise your hand option to participate. Okay, on that note, it's my pleasure to pass the floor over to Rebecca Titler. Over to you. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you all for being here today and to our panelists uh, and to Professor Shannon Lloyd. Um, I would like to begin by recognizing, as Anna has, that we are on unceded land in Jajage here. Um, this is the land of the Gunakahaga um, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, Jajage means where the two part ways, and this is a reference to the two communities of Gagnawage and Ganasatake um, that are still uh, strong to this day uh, in the area. Um, Jojage remains a meeting place for those of many different nations and viewpoints, and so we uh, have been trying to bring out some of those viewpoints uh, throughout this week of conversation. If you are not in Jojage, Montreal, and are instead elsewhere, um, and you were interested in finding out whose land you are on, you can look that up at nation dash uh, land.ca and I will put, uh, sorry, it's it's native-land.ca and I will put that in the chat um, so that you can look that up if you like. Um, with that, I would like to welcome Professor Shannon Lloyd to introduce our speakers today. Professor Lloyd is a, a professor in the Department of Management here at Concordia and also I believe cross appointed in the Department of Building Civil and Environmental Engineering. She is also a very valued member of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and a truly interdisciplinary researcher. Um, so please take it away, Shannon. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and uh, welcome all of you to this panel on life cycle assessment. Um, today we're going to have three speakers. As uh, Alaha Fakur, Zainab Yosef Sadai, and Deb Chatterjee. They're all graduate students who I work with. And um, I'll introduce each of them before, before their presentation. And then, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, after each presentation, we'll stop for any points of clarification uh, that you may have. And at the end, we'll have a panel session where we'll open the floor for questions and answers. But again, you can uh, post your questions as we go, and then we'll get to them after the presentations. So let me start by introducing our first speaker, Alaha Fakur. Uh, Alaha is a PhD candidate in environmental engineering at ATS. Um, her research is funded by our Green Surface Engineering and Advanced Materials Network. And her research is really focused on trying to develop a life cycle assessment based framework to help understand what the environmental impacts of novel surface engineering solutions might be. And so we're trying to do that early in research and development so that we can inform the process to have better environmental outcomes. So with that, Alaha, I will turn the floor over to you to present um, your, your presentation. Thank you, Shannon, for introducing me. And hi, everyone. I share my screen. Um, so my presentation topic is about prospective LCA of emerging surface engineering technology. In this uh, presentation, uh, I will talk about the challenges regarding the uh, prospective LCA studies. 
At first, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what is life cycle assessment methodology. LCA is a methodology for assessing environmental impacts associated with all stages of a life cycle products, from resource acquisition until its end of life. A life cycle methodology includes four phases, in goal and scope, inventory analysis, impact assessment, and interpretation. Life cycle assessment is a decision-making tool which consider uh, all of the environmental, social, economic, and technical feasibility aspects. It also uh, is a comprehensive assessment including all the stages of a product and consider all major and important environmental impacts. However, life cycle assessment has some drawbacks. For example, performing a comprehensive LCA is costly and time consuming. It's a data intensive method and gathering all the data needed for the study is a really time consuming uh, task. Um, and also for many materials and processes, uh, we don't have enough data. So in order to fill the data gaps, we need to um, use the surrogate data, which are not um, precise enough. So these are the problems according to the life cycle assessment, which is used for, uh, um, for existing technologies. However, did you ever think of performing LCA for an emerging technology? An emerging technology means dealing with lack of inventory databases, new types of materials, unexpected new impacts, unexpected lifetime of a product, challenges of recyclability, and uncertainties of unknowns, and also lack of historic data. So all of these challenges are according to prospective life cycle assessment. A prospective life cycle assessment is all about the future of a technology. We talk about future mobility, future energy, and future materials. So how we can make sure to guide the developments in an environmentally friendly way. At first, let me describe uh, what is an emerging technology. Uh, from a, a study by Rotolo, there are five attributes that characterize an emerging technology. First of all, technology should be novel, and it is also indicate it is not only about improvements of already existing technology. Emerging technology should also have fast growth, so there should be large interest in this technology. Coherence over time, that means you have a very early emerging technology that people still use different terms uh, for the same things, but uh, the emerging technology converging to common definition of certain aspects of technology. Another aspect is benefits for a wide range of sectors. And lastly, also very important for us is prominent impact lies in the future. On the other study, emerging technology is described as a technology under a study which is a still in development phase or lab scale or bench scale. The future development of a technology depends on the development of the technology itself and then the development of the technological context. For example, the renewables, the new technologies or advanced materials. Of course, Around the technological systems, there is socioeconomic content that typically don't directly include into LCA model. But it is important to understand and will influence technological development in the future. And then uh, it's unknown and disruptive changes. For example, the pandemic situation, which uh, we are in right now, and I think no one ever thought about it. Uh, there are also two other indicators that are in, important uh, for uh, the technologies which are uh, in emerging uh, stages. The first one is technology readiness level or TRL, which is a systematic qualitative scaling method to evaluate the maturity of technologies and can be used as a tool to assist technology developers to track emerging technologies. Another one is manufacturing readiness level or MRL, 
which used to assess components and subsystems of a technology from a manufacturing perspective. We are now um, that um, we try to develop a technology that has the less environmental impacts. But how can we describe the environmental imp impacts over technology that describe at lab scale? And how would that perform when it is in industrial stage? For example, if you have a technology with, which is in TRL4, you might want to know how will it perform at TRL9. And what one can expect is true learning curves and economies of scale. The environmental impacts decrease when you go from lab scale to industrial scale. And on the other hand, uh, it's clear that uh, the technologies that are in lab scale are not uh, as same as the mature technology which are in industrial scale. When we are in the lab scale and in the first uh, TRLs, uh, we have more uh, degrees of freedom, freedoms to design the technology. For example, we can decide whether batch or continuous processes we are going to use or different inputs, different materials we are going to assess. But when the technology is developed, uh, we have less uh, degrees of freedom. So what are the challenges of a prospective LCA? Uh, for the goal and a scope uh, a stage, uh, it's important to know which moment in time is operational and also uh, choosing the right functional unit for the new and incumbent technologies. And also decide whether uh, which one of the incumbent technologies are going to uh, compare with the new technologies. In the inventory stage, uh, it should, uh, it's important to think about how will new and incumbent technology systems develop? How do background systems develop and market share of the new technology in the future? For the impact assessments, uh, it's challengeable to know the unexpected new impacts or also change of characterization factors. And lastly, for the interpretation, it's important to deal with the increased uncertainty and also possibility of unknown unknowns. Uh, my project is uh, doing a prospective LCA methodology for the surface engineering. Surface engineering is the technology and science used to modify surface properties of components with the purpose of improving the efficiency, extending lifetime, uh, protecting against harsh environment, and also enhance the tribological application. In order to enhance the surface properties of the coating, we have two methods, uh, whether using new processes or using new materials. New processes like physical vapor deposition, chemical vapor deposition, spraying technologies, which are uh, in TRL 4 or 5, um, and using new materials like um, nanomaterials with the enhanced X strength, durability, thermal, and electrical conductivity. The traditional processes uh, for surface engineering solutions have environmental health and safety hazards. However, the emerging technologies may reduce the traditional hazards, but introduce new risks to human health and environment. For example, uh, they introduce new type of source materials, energy sources, byproducts, and high vacuums. They also uh, make use of uh, scarce materials, and we have challenges with the recyclability of these new materials. But, um, how are, uh, what are the challenges of uh, prospective LCA of emerging surface engineering technologies? Uh, we have to deal with the lack of inventory databases for nanomaterials. Also, we, have, uh, we don't have the uh, inventory databases for new processes, and also we may have unexpected new impacts of nanomaterials, for example, uh, occupational safety and health in work spaces. Uh, we don't know the lifespan of the new technology, the new coatings. And also, we, we don't have the historic record of the new technologies. And for the end of life, there are many scenarios 
that uh, we can choose between them and also uh, the possibility of separating and recycling the atoms. In the next presentation, my colleague Zainab uh, will introduce some of uh, these challenges uh, in her uh, case study. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Alaha, for such a great presentation on perspective LCA and more specifically focused on perspective LCA of surface engineering solutions. Um, I'm going to pause here. We're going to save uh, discussion type questions till the end, but does anybody have any points of clarification that they would like to raise at this point? So I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to assume that we're good and we'll move on. So our next speaker is Zainab Yosef Zadeh. Uh, she's a master's student in industrial engineering at the Gina Cody School of Engineering here at Concordia University. Um, Zainab is near the end of her master's work, and as part of it, she's, she's finished one case study and has started on a second case study, both looking at novel surface engineering applications. In one, she was collaborating with researchers at the University of Alberta, and in the second one, she's collaborating with two industrial partners. Um, she's in, in this presentation, she's going to talk a little bit about the challenges she faced because of the fact that these are emerging solutions. So with that, Zainab, I will turn the floor over to you to present your work. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, just a minute. <laughs> Um, it's a challenge. <laughs> I can't find my uh... no problem, Zainab. While you're looking, I'll, I'll tell everybody a little bit about the Green Seam Network. Okay, so thank you. you. Keep looking, and once the once your screen goes live, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, sure. So that all of you are aware, um, both Allah and Zainab's work is is funded by, as I mentioned, the Green Surface Engineering and Advanced Materials Network, which is a a, a network funded by NSERC. Um, located primarily at Concordia University, but with partners across the country and the world, both from academia and industry. And so there are five themes for the five themes are working on developing surface engineering solutions, both processes and, and materials and applications. And um, our theme, there's, uh, there's a, a fifth theme, which is focused on LCA, and there are researchers at Concordia, uh, Polytechnique, ETS, and Sherbrooke. Um, and students who are looking at methods to integrate LCA into the research and development process um, to better understand the environmental impacts to ensure that these green surface engineering and advanced material solutions are indeed green. Okay, so, I'm so ready. ready. Yes, Perfect. Yes, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can you see my full screen? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, the title of my presentation is Challenges in Prospective LCA of Emerging Surface Engineering Processes and Applications. In this presentation, I want to talk about the uncertainties in the process of modeling the LCA for an emerging technology, which is produced by surface engineering methods. Also, I will explain how these challenges led us to specific practices to tackle these uncertainties. The LCA that we have done was a comparative LCA between two pipe heating systems, including heating cable system as the incumbent technology, which exists about 100 years, and an emerging technology of multi-layered coating system, which is still in lab scale developed in Alberta University. The new system developed with same functionality as conventional cable system with 30% improved electricity efficiency. For easy tracking in this presentation, please follow incumbent system with orange color and emerging system with blue. I borrowed the chart in Elahe's presentation to show the technology readiness level of these two systems. Cable incumbent system is in, a, in the mass production level and its TRL is 10, which is matured product. 
In contrast, coating system is lab scale portfolio, which means it has validation in lab scale, demonstrated performance of components and interfaces between components in lab scale and, labora and laboratory results validated uh, that all components work together. The technology readiness level uh, of coating system is four, which is a low number and it is identified as an emerging technology. In the study of uh, Moni, uh, sorry, yeah. In a study uh, by Moni and his colleagues, uh, the LCA challenges linked to the novelty of a system were categorized under the four titles, including comparability, data, scaling up, and uncertainties and communication of uncertainties. In LCA modeling, uh, the emerging technology regarding uh, to uh, our LCA, uh, the challenges um, led us to the questions that, uh, will it be a drop in replacement means can we use the lab data as it is for modeling? Is lab per performance predictive of field performance? Uh, how will production uh, processes and performance change. How will the electricity mix in Canada change? Use uh, conservative uh, assumptions, uh, reduced system boundaries, sensitivity analysis, and plan for new studies. We address these challenges in our study. The conservative uh, assumptions for emerging technology that we considered, including considering five meter pipe lengths as functional unit. Although the lab experiment was one meter, we decided to choose five meter for functional unit because it was the appropriate length to apply coating and also it can be transported with normal truck. We use the lab scale material and energy usage. Uh, we use lab scale energy performance, 30% uh, more efficient than incumbent technology. We expect a 10 year life as compared to 40 years for the incumbent technology. Uh, the base scenario was used in Alberta as one of the high non-renewable electricity mix. Also, we excluded maintenance and repairment and also end of life because the lack of data that we had in this, these phases. Based on the assumption, uh, the result for baseline scenario showed that in all impact categories, including human health, climate change, ecosystem quality, and resource depletion, the impact of emerging technology, blue bars, are less than incumbent technology, orange bars. Uh, noting that the dark blue and dark orange display the use phase electricity impact it is a bit hard to see the light orange production of incumbent system because it is very low. But uh, here you can see in Alberta, use phase electricity consumption drives impact. Uh, it means the more electricity efficient emerging technology uh, is environmentally preferable for all categories of impact. Therefore, we started to question about regions other than Alberta. Is the emerging uh, system environmentally preferable throughout Canada? We expanded the model for uh, operating all provinces and electricity mixes across Canada. The squares show impact categories and when it is orange, it means the incumbent system is preferable. And when it is blue, the emerging system is environmentally preferable. On the map, the light blue show the region that emerging is preferable in all impact categories. And the light orange display zone that incumbent, uh, incumbent system is preferable. The result in gray zones are mixed considering Quebec with 90%, 95% renewable and Alberta 90% non-renewable electricity, we can see the emerging technology is preferable where more non-renewable electricity is used. What level of improved efficiency in emerging technology is required for environmental preferability? 
In this chart, each circle shows the intersection of a climate region with average winter length in horizontal, horizontal axis and the electricity mix impact, the vertical axis. As you go right in this chart, the frost day increases. And as you come down, the electricity mix impact decreases. The color code of dots shows needed efficiency for emerging technology to be environmentally preferable in a climate zone. Emerging technology in lab scale already obtained 30% less electricity consumption, which is lead, led to environmentally better score in many regions are showed in green dots. In yellow zone, emerging technology needs to have more efficiency to be environmentally preferable in, the, in that region. And in provinces like Quebec, the red circles, it seems impossible just with uh, improving efficiency, we can reach the environmental preference because needed efficiency is more than 100%. As, as Canada worked toward its plan to reach 90% non-emitting electricity by uh, 2030, the useless electricity saving will not be enough to make the emerging technology preferable in future. What lifespan is required for environmental preferability? In this chart, the efficiency is 30% and we increase the lifespan to analyze the sensitivity of impact to lifespan. The lifespan has a significant effect on production impact. In baseline, we assumed it 10 years, but what if in practical stage, it lasts more 20, 30, 40 years? In this chart, uh, blue dots show the provinces that emerging uh, system is preferable in all impact category in all regions. The orange dots shows the provinces, here just Quebec, that uh, the incumbent system is completely preferable. Uh, and the uh, yellow, mm, yellow uh, circle is the mixed results. By considering 20 year lifespan for emerging system, you can see how the results change in favor of emerging system. While increased lifespan can improve the environmental preferability of the emerging technology, Quebec has the highest renewable electricity and it is representing future trends. You can see just by considering 50 years lifespan, we can have emerging system preferability in this province. Uh, what other changes are needed to ensure that the emerging technology is environmentally preferable? There are still too many uncertainties to explore current study. In fabrication, we can investigate on material and process improvement. In use phase, we can include some scenarios for maintenance and repair. Also, we can include end of life to study by investigating on, end, uh, on removal methods, waste man management and opportunities for recyclability. Now we are in the process of new study with two industrial experts in coating repairment and removal, namely VLM advanced technology with pulse water jet technology and Zafron with reverse electroplating technology. We hope this study can shed light on the maintenance and end of life modeling of conducted LCA and help us to have a more accurate assessment of emerging system. Con uh, conclusion, for conclusion, regarding conservative assumptions and reduced system boundaries, we should be aware that environmental preferability can change on uh, where the emerging technology is used by applying different uh, scenarios and co uh, conducting sensitivity analysis, we can see increasing the energy efficiency and the lifespan of the emerging technology will increase uh, environmental uh, preferability, but it is not enough. All these uncertainties linked to, to the novelty of the system le uh, lead us to future work. More researchers are needed to answer important questions about production and end of life to be able to update this LCA. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab, for your presentation and for sharing the results and challenges of your case studies and also for your novel use of sensitivity analysis to identify objectives for developers 
to identify what changes can be made to improve the environmental um, preferability of, of surface engineering technologies. Um, at this point, I'll stop for any points of clarification. Uh, Rebecca? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Zena. That was really interesting. I just wanted to clarify that when you talk about the um, the, the lifespan as being 10 years, that's the lifespan, average lifespan of each pipe, not the 10 in 10 years, we'll expect, you know, a completely new technology to replace this technology, right? It's, it's um, pipe, pipes. Uh, actually, uh, the pipe's lifespan is more than 10 years, but the coating that we uh, applied on the pipe, we, we are not, uh, we, we, because we don't have any recorded data about the lifespan of this coating, this specific coating, and this specific application of the coating system. Uh, we have the, uh, we, we assume that it is 10 years, and it is a conservative, it is very, very um, minimum lifespan but because the the coating is on the uh, on the pipe uh, we need to uh, i mean see both of them in a, one system with 10 years lifespan Is thank you thank you zainab do we have any other points of clarification all right and as i mentioned before we'll save our discussion questions for the end so with that we're gonna we're gonna switch gears we started with two uh, engineering researchers and now we're going to transition to a business scholar um, with that, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Deb Deep Chatterjee. Um, Deb is a doctoral student in management at the John Wilson School of Business, also here at Concordia University. His research is focused on firm engagement and sustainability practices. You know, that is, he's asking questions about why firms decide to engage in specific sustainability practices as opposed to others, um, and what are the you know, ultimate outcomes of those sustainability engagements. Um, so today he's going to present his findings on a project focused on firm adoption of LCA and in the chemical sector. So with that, I'll transition um, the floor to you, Deb. Thank you, Shannon. Um, so yep, yeah, I'll be sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Uh, so. Hi, and uh, thank you, Zainab and Elahai. Uh, so I would be talking about uh, how uh, chemical companies in US have been adopting a life cycle assessment. And uh, so it's like, why aren't they adopting it? Uh, so, um, uh, the, uh, so broadly, the agenda is that I'd be talking about the scope of analysis, uh, the methodology that we followed, the findings in terms of the adoption patterns that we observe, the dynamics of uh, corporate uh, sustainability reporting, the media and the LCA adoption that's going on, and also briefly talking about the uh, emergence of sta uh, standards and policy and a growing body of research around LCA that has evolved over the years. So um, uh, our starting point was that we looked at the uh, chemical industry in US. Now, this is particularly an interesting setting because chemical industry, uh, they face a lot of public and regulatory pressure to improve their uh, environmental performance. And um, so, so we started uh, to look at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the public firms, which were listed in the NYSE, and uh, they were all listed under the SIC 28, which is the broad umbrella under which uh, chemical firms operate. Now, the timeline that we looked at was 1987 to 2017. Uh, and this really captures the bulk of improvement and adoption of LCA technologies in, in the US. And uh, so we came up with 189 firms which met this criteria. So all our results are pertaining, are confined to these 189 uh, firms. Now, as um, when we started uh, our, our project, we, we, we uh, looked at prior literature. We also uh, discussed with industry experts. We came up with eight keywords and, and we searched uh, uh, these eight keywords in, in uh, these four sources. So we looked at the corporate TIVA, which is a database for uh, media uh, coverage. 
we looked at the the company websites and the publicly available documents and then we read all these uh, the, the results all, all the uh, all the uh, keywords results and then we uh, engaged with industry experts to identify serious cases of lc adoption which is to say we did not really consider when companies were let's say in a conference talking about it once so that is not proof enough that they have adopted it so we we wanted to assess and identify serious adoptions only so our findings are sorry so this is an example for example Bax, this is uh, taken from baxter sustainability report where they uh, quite explicitly talk about uh, using L lca and also the consequences in terms of the better perform environmental performances that they have uh, experienced uh, so overall our um, adoption um, sorry, yeah uh, adoption of LCA over the years. This is this is the uh, pattern that we have uh, found. Uh, the blue, the, the red line is a cumulative adoption, which means that every time we we find evidence that a firm is uh, is engaging in LCA, the number goes up by one. Uh, so as you see, it is growing up, and uh, there are different trends to it, which we'll talk about later. And also, the blue line is the number of active users, which means that if let's say a company started it in two thousand two and ended in 2011 there is a minus one in the in the 2012 because that company in that specific year is not using it so some key figures is that the first adoption was done by procter and gamble in 1988 overall among this uh, 189 firms there is 21 percent of the firms which have been using lca and uh, 2010 uh, the year 2010 is the most active year in terms of uh, uh, the engage the adoption because eight uh, we found evidence that eight companies adopted it and an, on an average um, a firm tends to use it um, for a year for 8.5 years after using it of course this this analysis is done and it ends in 2017 so this average number might go up as we uh, as we go down the years um, in terms of the new adoption and, and and the exits, the blue line sort of shows the first few years were really slow, and then after 2017, there was a surge in the in the adoption. And uh, as far as the exit shows, that it's relatively quiet uh, till 2008, and then there we find more uh, companies dropping out um, after after 2010. Now the exits, there is a cautionary note here that we find no evidence of continued use. Now that can also be because they're not talking about it. And also sometimes we see that a firm which is let's say using LCA uh, ceases to exist because it has been acquired by somebody. So it goes out of uh, our sample and we count it as no longer being used. And also we find some evidences where uh, we, we see that the companies sort of like start to use it in par partnership with an industry body or an academic institution. And there is not like evidence enough that they have been continuing to use it. Uh, about uh, the dynamics of CSR and the media coverage and LCA use. Now the sharpest blue line, which is rising the highest that you see on the screen is uh, the CSR report. Now, the CSR report is quite mainstream now, and most of the companies do issue a CSR report. And um, as you see, the 33% on, on the right, the 62 companies published at least one CSR report, that is that accounts for 33% of our sample. Uh, 40, as I, as I said, there were 40 companies who used, which is 21%, however, 65% of these CSR issuing companies, they have adopted LCA. Uh, of them, 34 have discussed them in the CSR and 29 have explicitly referred to CSR, uh, sorry, LCA in their reports. Now the terminology varies because based on the context and uh, in terms of the media, as you see that in the early, which is the red line, in the early 90s, there has been some uh, discussions in the media and then it was followed by a relative uh, quiet number of years and then again it it, it uh, increased during when the adoption increased uh, after 2007. I would be coming back to this later. Uh, there are other studies which have also looked at uh, LCA adoption and mostly they are surveys and uh, they, they are based in different regions and different industries but overall our adoption rate is consistent to some extent except uh, the second study that you see on the screen is by Stewart et al, but it really looks at a much more um, 
comprehensive database because it looks at all uh, CSR which are which are written in English in, from the corporate register. So that's that's a much more. Um, a, it, it looks at a far more a number of uh, firms than ours. Uh, going back to the adoption period, uh, as we see that uh, there are three distinct phases. The first is the early adoption phase, which is relatively uh, slow and goes on from almost 1988 to 2007. Now, uh, at this point, it is important to note that the cost of adoption is high and mostly the firms uh, who are uh, adopting it could be the environmental leaders or the larger firms who have the resources to adopt it. And then there's a, a short period of growth uh, between 2007 and 11, and then there's a relative stagnation. Now, uh, in the growth period, uh, we see that there is more uh, support in terms of there are more consulting firms, there are more invent uh, softwares for LCA available, there are more databases which are available, and then stagnation is a period when companies are reflecting because there are more environmental practices available. So you really wanna see how valuable it is, um, or maybe it is not driving enough competitive advantage and you have stopped talking about it. So the, these like raises, like any research process raises more questions than it answers, I think. Um, uh, in conjunction, um, there, there is a, a number of uh, the, the standards and policy which have grown over the years, which have uh, directly or indirectly uh, helped or played a role in the in the in the in the process of adoption or diffusion of the LCA. And first, in 1990 and 1993, the uh, SETSA published the LCA code of conduct, and they coined the LCA terminology. And then in 92, there was the chemical industry um, uh, adoption of the stewardship the product stewardship code, which didn't really mandate LCA use, but it um, sort of talked about life cycle thinking. And this is the period, if, you, if you're if you thinking of the media hype and there, there's a media coverage going on in this, in this time. So that might have been one of the reasons. And then uh, there is the ISO 14,040 and the, and the 2002 bill, um, the farm bill, and then 2007 Energy Independ uh, Independence and Security Act. And all of this together sort of like could have played a, a, a role in gathering momentum in terms of the diffusion after 2007. And uh, before I wrap it up, I just wanted to show uh, that LCA publications uh, in terms of th this chart shows articles published per year where at least one of the authors were uh, US based in terms of they could, they, they could be academic or industry or government. And it has really skyrocketed. And it's sort of like the adoption is decoupled. It's not really, it's not reflective of the number of uh, yearly publication again is uh, dynamics uh, of like whether the same firms are using it or are driving the driving the research or um, whether or not like there is not uh, the results are not um, uh, favorable or if the companies are uh, not finding value in it or are they not talking about it so that there is also this uh, dynamics which is playing out um, in terms of the academic and the and the and um, the industry adoption rate, so uh, that will be it. And thank you so much. Shannon, are you there? I think we may have lost Shannon. So nope, uh, I'm here. I'm oh, here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so for, first, I want to thank Deb for uh, sharing your findings and insights about firm adoption of LCA. Um, and before we go to questions, I want to thank all three speakers, um, Allah, Zainab, and Deb. It's a pleasure working with you on these projects. Um, and it was a pleasure hearing you present on your research. And so with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions that we may have. I don't see any questions in the Q&A forum. Um, you all can feel free to post your questions or to raise your hand. Uh, Rebecca, please. Yeah, I can, I can start us all off since I don't have to type. Um, so thank you, all three of you, for really interesting presentations. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, I have a lot to learn, <laughs> though, however. Um, and I was wondering, well, I have two questions. Um, 
One is both of our first speakers, you both talked about the PLCA, so preliminary before products are released. And Deb, you looked at LCA proper, right? So not the PLCA. So I was just wondering um, if any of you can address this question as to how common the PLCA is um, and if it's becoming more common or if this is still, we're still in the preliminary stages of developing the PLCA because it seems to me that this is something that we should be thinking of, you know, before we start, <laughs> start making problems rather than as an afterthought. Well, in case of uh, PLCA, in my case, uh, we say it's uh, mostly prospective LCA, not PLCA. So I think it's not a problem and it's not a confusion. Um, I'll add a quick comment, um, Rebecca. So I, I think that, um, you know, coming from a consulting um, background where we were doing LCA and um, also now in an academic, I think prospective LCA is, is increasingly common. Um, and we're increasingly seeing a body of research about prospective LCA because it's really hard um, when we don't have data to, to complete the model. And so I think there's a growing interest. You know, some, some companies, um, their LCA practice lives in marketing and some companies, their LCA practice lives in research and development and, and in other functions. And sometimes it's cross-disciplinary, but for those where it lies in research and development, the focus really is on green design. And so they're really trying to inform their design process. And so um, the reason why we're seeing a growth in research in this area is because we see the potential of this framework for informing as opposed to evaluating what currently exists. Um, so I think it's relatively common, but still relatively uncertain. Can I add something? Absolutely. Uh, the, the Green Sim is a good example for that. Uh, the Green Sim Network in Concordia, uh, in, Con in Can Canada, uh, decided to um, do LCA for their project, the research project that is uh, in developing uh, stage. And uh, I think it's, it's a, I mean, the surface engineering is a very fast growing industry and uh, we have a lot of application of surface engineering in automotive, uh, aerospace, and it is, is kind of good example of this growth. Thanks so much. I have a follow-up question. <laughs> I, I also, I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Deb. No, I, I, I cannot directly speak of PLC, uh, but um, I, I think when we were um, seeing or like reading the articles, we found um, sometimes that um, firms do engage and you find some evidence is there's something going on uh, in the background. They don't really talk about it and they're in a consortium or uh, they are um, uh, partnering, example, Green Seam. And then after like five years, suddenly you see it in their CSR report, like it's coming back. So you see the, and you sort of like understand from it that they have been working on it, maybe their R&D and not talking about it. And then they sort of implement it. So it's interesting uh, to see that as well. Right. And do you have any sense of whether it actually leads to change? Can you tell? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Can, do we have any sense as to whether it actually leads to change? Do firms change their practices after doing an LCA? Does that, does that differ maybe depending on whether it's in marketing or research and mm -hmm. development? Well, I'll, I'll jump in, Rebecca. I'll say that we, we do see statements indicating that um, there has been change. So. Um, you know, an example would be, um, you know, Procter & Gamble has had a large marketing campaign about their uh, cold water tide product. And with, when you look at the, those uh, uh, pieces of information, they're communicating the fact that they did LCA on all of their product um, groupings. And they identified that one of their largest areas of impact from a life cycle perspective was the use phase when people were using hot water in their washing machines. And so that um, was used to inform a prioritization of R&D in a cold water product that would get the same outcome. Whether it did or didn't, I don't know, but that, you know, that's the communication. Um, and, you know, in Deb's research, that's one of the next questions that we have. So we, see, we hear a lot of indication that LCA is being used to inform 
decisions or that it's resulting in these savings, but we don't know. And so, um, I know mean, that's a, it's a really important research question. And a lot of the sustainability practices that we see going on is which of these practices, act, practices actually lead to change. And so that is definitely a, a good question. I think maybe we have another question. So um, to all of the speakers, have the speakers ever come across a prospective LCA that gave place to an LCA afterwards? So that is, had the predictive nature of the, the uh, prospective LCA been confirmed? So a situation in which there was a prospective LCA, and then after the thing came to market, we were able to determine that yes, indeed, the findings were accurate. Uh, Zainab Alaha, in your research, have you either seen um, examples? Uh, I I think I I didn't understand the okay the. So the question is, you know, pr perspective LCA is predictive in nature. So we're okay. trying to we're trying to predict the future, yeah. and so the question was: Do we know of any examples where someone did a prospective LCA, and then at a later point in time validated the findings that oh, yes, like indeed. a follow up study that yeah. see okay the study that I did. Uh, actually, I I didn't see something like that, but yeah, this is this is the. Pro process of validation it should be in the studies um but yeah i didn't see something like that in in the things that i i read yeah uh, i add a point uh, in one of the articles i have read uh, it was a repetitive uh, methodology for the prospective lca and when uh, the technology will develop uh, we add the extra data that we have and um, resume the uh, method again and uh, enhance the um, enhance all of the data that we have and add after the first uh, study. Yeah, and I, I can add a little bit before going on to the next question. I, I have seen instances of, of companies that have um, do recurring LCAs on their products. And so, um, in some cases in design and then when the products are marketed and then again after they've been on the market for a while. And so in that case, I don't know for certain that they validated the predictions of their initial LCA, but they have gone through that process of, of um, confirming them. Zainab has a great opportunity. One of the processes that she's studying in this existing case study um, has only been, um, it's developed specifically for the manufacturing process that it's used in. Um, and so we're looking at a different application for a larger, more complex um, removal of coatings from a larger, more complex um, component. And it would be interesting if that process then is put in place to go back in you know, five years and, and validate it. Um, okay, so the next question is um, for all of you, uh, how do you think the research in this area will evolve in the next five years? Um, for example, in particular related to COVID. So I think we could think beyond just surface engineering, but thinking LCA in general, um, how do you think the research will evolve? Uh, Let me jump in. <laughs> yeah, I think um, Deb is good. In terms of uh, in terms of firms, I think it's uh, it's going to be really interesting in terms of like how firms alter their practices and how this sort of. I mean, in general, again, I don't think I can specifically talk about LCA, but like in the last two years, there has been uh, more um, scrutiny in terms of like, if you see the number of um, uh, environmental related activism has increased both in the boardrooms and not. So like firms are definitely in terms of COVID, it, it puts them in more uh, challenging position. So I, I feel like the adoption rate it's hard to say that it'll go up or something, but it's uh, definitely there'll be some uh, momentum to this. Uh, what do you think, Shannon? Yeah, I mean, so I think that there's a, a couple of things that are going on. So I think Deb pointed to one of the things. I, I think that there's so many, we are, the knowledge in this area has, has advanced um, radically in 20 years. And so our understanding of 
um, you know, value chains and product life cycles has increased. Um, I also, you know, the amount, the number of frameworks and the possibilities for investing in things that are more sustainable have increased. And so I think companies are thinking very critically about where to invest their dollars. And so I think one of the big challenges for LCA right now is can it prove that it is valuable? Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't really have, and, and this isn't just for LCA, this is for many sustainability practices, we don't have compelling evidence um, that they both generate value for companies and um, generate value for society. And so I think that there's going to be a growth of research in this area to figure out what actually makes a difference. Um, I think in relation to COVID, um, I think there's another trend in LCA that is quite relevant, or two trends really. One is that we're increasingly seeing LCA used to inform policy and also being inserted in policy. So policy that requires um, some entity to use life cycle thinking or life cycle assessment based you know, analyses to inform decisions in order to be compliant with policy. So we're seeing a growth of that in a variety of jurisdictions. Um, so I think that's one trend that we'll continue to see. And I think it'll, it, it, it will also trigger the other area, which is there's a growing trend of incorporating uh, human health. So now life cycle assessment includes impacts to human health from environmental releases, but it doesn't include impacts to human health from um, occupational uh, exposures or, or events, as well as product use. And so, um, you know, with COVID, I think that that's another area that you know, sort of raises this this shortcoming of LCA is that we're not actually capturing these types of human health issues. And um, again, there's a growing body of research, a very slowly growing body of research in that area, trying to integrate human health into LCA. So I think those are some changes we'll see. Um, let's see, I don't see any more questions. Am I missing anything? I think we've answered the questions that have been posted. Um, does anybody else have a question that they'd like to raise? So I want to add something to your Perfect. comment. Uh, yeah, I think that the COVID, um, as you said, it has two trends. One of them, uh, 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 I mean, impact negatively on the e economy and it is not in favor of the sustainability assessments uh, because uh, the, the economy needs to be thrive fastly and uh, compensate all the problems that uh, uh, he it had in the uh, COVID period. But uh, also we had the opportunity to see how the, the reducing the uh, um, reducing the um, human activity uh, effect on the the, the, uh, the climate and how it helps to and how we can adapt ourselves to these practices. And uh, maybe I mean, it's a two, two, two trend in two directions, but um, yeah, this can play and uh, uh, form the future of the sustainability studies. I will add one, one additional point that Zainab experienced directly in the way in which COVID impacted research in this area is data collection. Um, we had to go, you know, it was a big challenge to get access to the facilities at the industrial industry partners to actually observe the processes, understand the processes and collect data for doing the analysis. So um, that, that has been an interesting impact that we've actually experienced as well. Okay, I think there are no more questions. So I think we're gonna wrap up this, this panel session on LCA. I hope you all enjoyed the discussion. We certainly did, Shannon. And in great part, thanks to your uh, excellent moderating skills. Uh, thank you for jumping in a few times. And of course, the three presentations that we listened to were so complimentary and what a great opportunity to just take an hour and really think through these issues. Thank you all for sharing your work with us. It's been really great. And I appreciate the, all the audience members who, who showed up as well to have a listen. Of course, we have recorded this. So if you weren't able to make it today, it'll be on our YouTube and you can share it with your friends and colleagues um, afterwards as well. And I'll pass things over to Rebecca to tell you about further events coming up. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to our panelists and to Shannon. This has been a really, um, really educational uh, uh, panel. I really appreciate all that I've learned. And I, like Anna, I'll say, I, 
I love to learn about the nitty gritties of what we can do. You know, it's, it's nice to talk about the generalities, but I really appreciate learning the, the details about this kind of uh, assessment work. So thank you all. Um, I will invite our, our audience as well. Thank you for being here. And I do hope you'll come back for those of you who are students or considering careers in sustainability. We do have our careers panel coming up next uh, at, uh, at three o'clock today, two o'clock today. Um, we will have three uh, professionals in sustainability coming from different uh, disciplinary perspectives and different fields and they will talk about what they do and how they got to where they are so if you are considering a career in sustainability please do come back for that um, after that at four o'clock we have Yvette Perfecto coming to talk about shade grown coffee that should be really interesting and then tomorrow morning we have our uh, our cities researchers, some of them who will be coming to talk about the living lab model and how we can use Montreal and Concordia University as a living lab to build a better cities for the future. Uh, and then we will have a panel on urban sprawl and we will close the conference with a fun session, uh, a fun Jeopardy session on climate change. So please do check out the complete schedule online wherever you found the information for this panel. Uh, and I think Anna has put it in the chat. Um, and uh, we will hope to see you soon. Thank you also to the amazing team at Force Space, to Anna and Doug. We would not be able to do this without you. Thanks, everybody. On that note, we're closing things up Thank for so all of you. Have a great afternoon, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.